Who invented the microprocessor? When computers changed from using these big, bulky, fragile vacuum tubes to miniature transistors, it was a matter of time before someone will figure out how to put the entire brain of a computer in a single chip. And when it finally happened, it sparked a series of events that nearly set history in a completely different direction to what we know today. Brought to you by the Nebula and Curiosity Stream Bundle. It's the end of the 60s, and Fairchild, an American chip company, is making the best out of the transistor revolution. One of their best employees, Italian engineer Federico Fagin, and probably the hero of today's story, had recently led the team that figured out a method to make transistor gates out of silicon, rather than aluminum, which made for faster, smaller, and more power-efficient integrated circuits. A method that will end up becoming so important that it will give a name to an entire region and an industry decades later. But at the moment, the discovery did not particularly impress his superiors, given that it would require massive changes to the way they do things, and so they were slow to adopt the technology. But some were ready to capitalize on Fairchild's mistake, and a group of engineers had left to form a scrappy startup called Intel. You might have heard of them. Fagin was sure they intended to take silicon technology to the next level. After fighting with his company for years, he resolved to go where he believed the future was and asked Intel for a job. For Intel, the cult of this experienced designer could not have come at a better time. A Japanese calculator company called Musicom had signed a contract for them to design a high-performance desktop calculator that used only seven chips. But Intel, believing miniaturization technology had finally reached maturity, promised to push all the functionality of four of those ships into a single one. But promises are easy, and chip design is hard. And the first day Fagin arrives at Intel, he's handed the calculator project that is massively behind schedule and with a representative from Busicom arriving from Japan the very next day. Masato Shishima, the engineer from Busicom, was terribly unimpressed at the author's lack of progress. He could hardly contain his anger at Fagin and having traveled halfway through the world only for there to be nothing for him to check. His anger irritated Fagin, who had only been two days at Intel so far, and had no interest in being beaten over an error that was not his fault. Okay, look Mr. Shima, you can continue to bitch or you can help me. I don't like this situation any more than you do, but if we're going to savage this, I'm gonna need you to act more and stop complaining. I did not make Fagin curse for no reason, like this is a direct quote from the interview I use as a source. Coming from a Japanese culture, Shima was shocked that someone who is supposed to be the client will be treated this way, but I guess he had never met Italians. But he did agree to stay and help Intel design the chips his company had requested, and to Fagin's surprise, the man was very good at logic design. After only an introduction on the basic method, he completed the entire logic design of the Miracle chip by himself. The result was the Intel 4004, the world's first microprocessor, the first computer brain in a chip. And with Fagin signing it at the circuit level, no one will be able to deny him credit this time. For once, he was finally sure his contributions would be appreciated, and that he was at the cusp of the wave of the future. Surely Intel will recognize the monumental significance of this invention, right? 1974. Years had passed since the introduction of the 4004, but Fagin was not happy. His team had introduced several new, improved microprocessors since, but every single time it had required months of convincing for the big brass at Intel to authorize their projects. In the minds of the Intel board, theirs was not a processor company but a general semiconductor company, and products like a microprocessor were only useful in the sense that they could be used to get clients to also buy more memories and other chips. Fagin felt caged in, boxed, frustrated. After he had helped usher silicon transistors and integrated circuits, he was sure microprocessors were the next big thing, and he could not understand why anyone in Intel could not see that. And he suspected he was not the only one to think that. Hey Rolf, can we go for a drink? <sighs> you see what they're doing, how they keep ignoring and delaying us. If we keep this up, Intel will be left into dust. In fact, I think it already started. I'm leaving Intel. I would like to start a company to build microprocessors. Wait, you're leaving to form your own company? In the middle of a recession, when they just laid off 10% of the workforce? Yes. Okay, so what's the product? Microprocessors. I will make it up as I go. Ralph Ungerman 
was chief of microprocessor development, working directly under Fagin on Intel processors. A networking and computer expert, he, maybe better than anybody, might understand the colossal mistake Intel was making, and will be just crazy enough to do something about it. Screw it, let's go. And just like that, in an enormous leap of faith, they were on business. As the two men continue drinking, they try coming up for a name on their new business. But the next day, when they try remembering any name, they would just draw a blank. Clearly, if the name of their company could not survive a night of drinking, it was not good enough. So every night, they will drink and brainstorm and hope something will stick. And then, one day, I kind of like ILOG, you know, like the term integrated logic. It has a nice feeling to it. <gasps> I got it! Psylog! One hangover later. We really need to take it easy with the drinking. Ugh, this is maybe not the most constructive way to come up with a company. At least you had that Psylog name idea. That was really cool. <gasps> Psylog! Halloween 1974. Finally, they were ready to leave to create their own company, but not before they will accidentally recruit one other major collaborator. At Intel's Halloween party, Fagin finally announces to his team that he was leaving to form a new company. Wait, Federico, can I come with you guys? Shima, the same Japanese engineer Fagin had fought with on his second day of Intel. He had stayed at Intel to work after seeing the promise of microprocessors, and after having proven his skills, he would be the perfect missing piece for the new company. Once they had the money to actually pay him, that is, because if there's one thing that could ruin the stream, was a severe lack of capital. In order to fully understand a lot of the decisions Psylocke took, you have to understand how bonkers an idea it was to go and form a new company at this time. In 1973, just a year before this treatment left Intel, many countries in the world were experiencing a severe economic crisis, and among developed countries, the United States was having a particularly bad time. High levels of debt after a prolonged and costly war, and some controversial changes in the backing of the US currency were generating a shock that the stock market was seriously feeling. Combine this with an oil embargo that tripled the price of oil, then... Yeah, finding investment capital for the still small tech industry was not an easy feat. Side note, this oil embargo economic crisis is the very same that destroyed Nintendo's projects and silently pushed them towards video games in a previous video, Small World. But back in the US, the news that these legends had formed a new company caught the attention of the only type of company that will still have money during an oil shortage. Exxon Enterprises, the oil company, yep, that Exxon Mobil. It was not clear at the time what Exxon would be so keen to invest in a microprocessor company, but with the economic crisis being what it was, Psylocke had no choice if it wanted a chance at the market. Exxon's investments was not enough to fulfill Psylocke's full desires. For starters, it was not enough money to build a microprocessor factory, but it gave them a start, and it was now up to them to figure out how to design a microprocessor better than anything Intel could come up with in half the time and with a design general enough that others could fabricate it. Time was short, and the feeling that Intel could wise up to their mistakes and come up with a better microprocessor hung over their heads. The three men work with no rest for months. Fagin, who was supposed to be the CEO, ended up working on layouts, Shima focused on logic design and circuit design, and Ungerman, among many other things, led the process of creating tools so clients could check their designs based on their microcontroller. While building the simulator, he discovered a critical bug with the microcontroller layout. Shima! Shima! <sighs> we need to stop! There's a bug in the processor! Mm. Oh, no problem. We just have to add a contact in the circuit and it should work again. Did, did, did you just run the entire design in your hand and fix it? Masatoshi Shima, microprocessor design chat! At the end, the design he came up with was a combination of the best aspects of other microprocessors, while also being compatible with the base instructions of the Intel 8080, Fagin's favorite processor at the time, but extending it and simplifying it, so the three different voltages that Intel required in Psylog would be just one, meaning that it could easily be sold to engineers that were familiar with the 8080, but still be a much superior option. A year and a month after they started the project, Psylog had completed its first product, the Psylog C80, the microprocessor that they wish they could have made on Intel. And finally, the first ad for the product was run, straight up comparing it with Intel processors at the time and showing that the small company was ready to fight fire with fire. But if they were going to reach any market presence early, their biggest enemy was not Intel, 
but rather as if a company on the other side of the world that had a nasty habit of killing junk companies before they even started. But Psylocke had a secret plan. While in other videos I have talked a fair bit about the Japanese semiconductor revolution and how they will come to dominate entire segments of the industry, for companies in the United States, shipmakers in Japan had a reputation for cloning their best ships to make illicit copies using copyright tricks to escape legal action. In fact, barely a few episodes ago, I made a whole video about how Nintendo's first console might have been made out of one of these clones. Now, when Psylocke hits the market, one of their very first clients was NEC, one of those Japanese companies with such a reputation. And of course, they were all pretty sure that NEC was buying their products specifically to clone them. If NEC could clone the C80 and start selling it for cheaper, it might be game over for the junk company. Thankfully, Psylocke had a plan. In a move that was uncommon at the time, Shima had hidden a series of traps in the design purely for the purpose of frustrating any attempts at cloning. To this day, no one outside the original team knows exactly where all the traps are, but efforts from people such as Sergei Skorobogatov from the University of Cambridge has uncovered at least five of this reported nine traps. The fabrication method for this processor made it possible to add transistors that seem to be part of the circuit, but were actually connected to ground in the main circuit. This was nearly impossible to notice for someone examining a finished ship, and their effects went from obvious to increasingly subtle. These traps worked and bought Psylocke between 9 months and a year of time in the market, and while they faced first competition from bigger companies such as Intel and Motorola, the simplicity and cost of their ship made it a favorite for a lot of commercial products, such as the ColecoVision console, the extremely successful early Sinclair computers, and it became the brain for tons of arcade cabinets, including pretty much every Japanese hit during its golden era. Now, to be fair, Japanese companies and a couple of American companies would eventually figure out all the traps and start selling clones, such as the NEC 78K or the Sharp LR35902, which was used to power a very familiar and very popular gaming handheld. But clones took their time, and the legit sales of the C80 were promising a bright future. But given this level of success, how does the computer market decades later belong in large parts to Intel? And Silog is a name only relegated to retrospectives. Did any new competitors arise and kill them? Did Intel miraculously catch up? Well, as it often happens, the worst enemies are the ones hidden in plain sight. Unknown to everyone at Silog, since the start, Exxon had a secret reason to invest in the small company. You see, while home computers were a rising market, the big boy business computer industry was dominated by one company, IBM, International Business Machines, Big Blue. And no one had come close to matching their reputation for business use. However, Exxon wanted to gear up to take the business market right from their hands. Silently, they had been acquiring word processor companies, fax companies, electronic typewriter companies, and of course, Psylocke, to make chips to power it all. Their plan was, once Psylocke was proven in the market, to acquire the whole company and make it part of their empire. In the minds of the original founders, this discovery was deeply concerning. Psylock had been founded on the idea of using their talents to lead the microprocessor revolution away from the red tape and bad priorities of Intel, and no one was eager to now have to please a new overlord. As the 70s reached its end, Fagin will spend almost as much time fighting to keep Exxon at bay as he will spend working with clients, and his lack of business experience was quickly catching up with them. The company had not managed to scale its success and was trying too many new projects. Before long, experienced engineers were lacking at every level of the company. Fagin was a brilliant engineer, but an inexperienced CEO, and with no one to guide him, he quickly lost control of the company. And as things got rough, tensions flared. Ungerman believed he would be a better leader for the company during these trying times, and Fagin was too tired and too immature to defuse the situation. A strong rift was forming with different people taking sides and Exxon pitting them against each other in a bid to gain control of the company. Ungerman left the company in 1978 and Fagin was 
too tired from this fight to hold on for long. After a scary surgical intervention for a stress-induced perforated ulcer in 1976, he finally decided to step down and have Exxon buy the company in 1980. Around this time, IBM, seeing the success of computers like the Commodore, Apple or Spectrum, finally intended to enter the home computer market with what they call the IBM Personal Computer, a project that needed a microprocessor. This would have been a great opportunity for Psylog, but here's where being bought by Exxon completely screwed them. Because of the Exxon takeover, IBM was essentially prohibited from even considering any Psylog technology. But who was ready to make good of this opportunity? But Intel. Even if they had what was arguably the inferior product, they were available to work with IBM with their new 16-bit 8086 processor. The IBM PC ecosystem will go on to be so extraordinarily successful that it will basically become the de facto format for all home computers, and Intel made so much money from that that it finally realized their mistake and slowly refocused their entire business around processors. Crafting an architecture based on that one successful processor, now shortened to x86, that will come to be the standard for all personal computers for many many years to come, a standard that to this day few can challenge, and Psylog mostly became a memory of a time when the small company was almost the best in the business. Now the humble 8-bit Psylog C80 was so successful that it's still widely in production and usage today, even in products that you will not expect, making them the technological equivalent of a one-hit wonder. A perfect time in history where some of the most brilliant minds of the time collaborated to create their dream product. And the worst part is, they almost pulled it off twice. Because there was another chip, a 16-bit one, a processor once again vastly superior to anything Intel had, that almost managed to find a market, if it were not for the decisions of an entirely different company. So that is the topic for the video I just put up on my other series, SideQuest. SideQuest explores interesting side topics for every video I made. So if I make a video about the ZX Spectrum, the SideQuest episode is about how the company that made the ships accidentally got involved into a CIA weapons smuggling operation. Or if I make a video about the Game Boy Pocket, the side quest is about how the Game Boy camera was tested on loot pictures. Or for this video, I talk about Psylocke's surprisingly obscure 16-bit CPU and how it got screwed by some unexpected hit products. And every episode of SideQuest I post on Nebula, the creator-owned streaming service and basically the reason I can pay all the people who work on this video. 